So as Myron mentioned, I'm a chemist by training, and I realized last night I've actually spent 20 years studying chemistry now, which dates me quite a bit. Um, and so it's a little weird for me to not be talking about my chemistry. I've kind of been on autopilot, and when I'm asked to give a talk, I usually talk about chemistry. So instead, what I'm going to talk about today and what I was asked to talk about are some new initiatives that are going on in the Department of Chemistry, but are part of a broader group of initiatives on campus aimed at improving how we're teaching our undergraduate classes. And before I talk about those, I wanted to give you a little background of how those started, um, because I think it'll help give some perspective for the phase that they're at right now. So about two years ago, Tim McKay invited me to be part of a group called Rebuild. It's an NSF-funded group, and it consists of faculty and postdocs and a lot of the STEM departments in the College of LSNA. And we get together just about every other week for two years now. And our goal is to increase and improve the way we teach our undergraduate classes by increasing the amount of um, new educational strategies that we implement. So there's a rich body of literature of new strategies that are more effective than what we're currently doing. And our goal was to go through all that literature, analyze it, pick out the best strategies, and then start implementing them in our courses. And so the first part of my talk today is going to focus on work that was inspired by that group. Um, the second part of my talk is going to focus on a, another project that was started through HHMI funding. So about the same time that Tim asked me to be invo involved with Rebuild, I applied for and got my first grant in education. So before this, all my grants were in chemistry, and this was my first sort of foray into education. It was a bit of a leap for me, but I was excited when it got funded, and that meant I now need to do that work. So that grant had three different parts to it, and I'm going to talk about one of those today. And that part was completely overhauling how we're teaching our undergraduate first semester teaching lab to our students. Um, so that will be the second part of the talk. Um, and so the first part of my talk is going to focus on the lecture hall and our introductory large lecture courses. I chose this picture to start because it really highlights the challenges that I face as a teacher. I don't know if you can make me out in this picture, but if you take a look at the screen and move sort of straight down, there's a pink dot there. That's me. This is Chem 1800. It seats about 450 students. And my current enrollment in my class is 404 students. So we pretty much fill up the whole lecture hall. And it, you may be surprised to find out that that photographer is actually not even in the back of the room. <laughs> so she's about 10 rows down from the back of the room. And you can't really see me. You can't see my face. It's a really hard environment to keep everyone engaged. At least in here, in this smaller room, I can see everybody's face. I can look at you and try to keep you engaged. But it's much more difficult in this environment. The other challenge that we face here, and you can see it if you look closely in this picture, is that college today is very different than college when I went to school 20 years ago and when many of you also went to school. Our students now have cell phones, they have internet access, they have laptops, they have Facebook, they have Twitter, Snapchat, Yit Yak, all these other things that I don't even know. They're, they've got all of these tugs on their attention. And when I went to college, I didn't have any of that. I didn't even have a cell phone or a laptop. So when I went to lecture, I was focused on lecture. Our students don't have that luxury anymore. There's text messages coming in, emails coming in. And it's really hard over that course of an hour to not you know, pull it out. I mean, even when I'm in a faculty meeting, I pull out my phone sometimes and check it. It's just a really hard distraction to avoid. So a lot of what we're working on is trying to overcome both of these challenges. So how do I teach 400 students? So how do I do large-scale teaching, keep them engaged, get them learning during the class, um, during the, the entire period? And so those are my challenges. And um, one of the things I've learned from looking through the literature is that one of the biggest things that you learn is that me standing there talking for an hour to them is not the most engaging and effective way for them to learn. And so I think it's a little funny that I've been asked to come here today and talk to you for an hour about learning. And so what I tried to do in my talk today is incorporate some of the strategies that I use in my classroom. And so I'm going to ask you to participate in this lecture today as well. So this is actually the first thing you're going to have to do. So when you want to learn something new, what do you, how do you go about doing that? I want you to think about it. And I'm going to give you something specific so you can focus on that. I want you to think about if you had to learn a new language. So if you don't speak Chinese, let's pick Chinese, because that's a rather difficult one, I think, to learn, and one that we're most not exposed to in school. So just think about, for about 30 seconds, just how you would go about learning Chinese if I said you had to do it in the next two weeks. What would you go and do? If 
you already speak Chinese, pick a different language. <laughs> I know, I saw your hand go up. <laughs> Okay, so I often give my students time in class to think about something, and then I will ask them to then find somebody who's sitting next to them, preferably somebody they don't know, and ask them to share now what they just thought about. So I'm gonna ask you to do that. I want you to find somebody sitting next to you that you don't know, and tell them what you would do to try to learn a new language. I'll give you a minute. better at quieting down than my students. Normally I have a harmonica or some sort of bell that I ring to try to get their attention again, but again, there's 400 students, it's a little bit harder. Um, so what I'd like to do is call on three volunteers to tell me what your neighbor said to you. So not your strategy, but what your neighbor's strategy is. Yeah, and I'll repeat whatever I said so everyone can hear. Yeah, so that's, his comment was that we shouldn't allow technology in the classroom. That's a little bit difficult to enforce. Um, and for safety reasons, we can't shut off Wi-Fi and things like that in the, in the classroom. We can't block it. Um, does anybody have an answer? Tim or Myra to go around with the microphone. Sure. Okay, anyone else want to volunteer an answer for what, how they would go about learning? The one my neighbor gave was to find people who actually spoke that language. Exactly. Okay, so find people that spoke that language. What else? Yeah. My neighbor said to find someone who's done it before and then ask them what they did. So he said find someone who's done it before and ask them what their strategy was for learning. That's a great one. Amelia said that she would surround herself with the language constantly. So like podcasts and music she offered a lot. Yeah. That's a great idea. Okay, we'll take one more and then we'll move on. He wants to go to China for two weeks. Go to China for two weeks. That would be a great way. So you all came up with things that fit perfectly with what I was about to say next, which is learning takes place in a social environment. So there was a social component to every single answer that came here. You'd go to China, you'd go talk to someone who's done it before, you'd talk to someone who speaks the language. In all cases, we're learning from other people. You're here today because you want to learn from other people. We learn in a social environment, and this is an idea in the literature that's known as social constructivism, the idea that we construct our new knowledge by interacting with other people who are experts in that area. The other thing I heard from a lot of the answers was that you would actively be trying to speak the language, so you wouldn't just go listen to people talk, you would actually try to speak it. And that's a form of learning that we call active learning. You're not only thinking about the aspect of learning something, but you're actually doing it. And this cartoon is a little bit off, so we do want our students to be doing the doing during the class, but we also want them to be thinking about what they're doing. And so analyzing how are they doing? Are they getting the answer or are they struggling on something? What are they missing? So it's a combination of doing and thinking about what you're doing. So in the language example, if you're talking to somebody and they're really confused on their face and they understand Chinese, then you're, you're thinking that you're not doing it as well. <laughs> and so you try to figure out what it is that you're missing. Um, so both of these strategies are going to be really evident in all of the things I'm going to talk about today, and they're really the underlying principles that I use when I think about changes that I'm making to a course to make my students both more engaged and better learning environments for them. All right, so I have one example from myself um, that I tried to learn how to knit over winter break. That was one of my New Year's resolutions, and my husband bought me a book, <laughs> which uh, if you've ever looked at books on knitting are not all that helpful. As you can see from the example on the upper left, that was actually my third attempt, <laughs> not my first. And um, what I want to point out is that you know knitting is something that obviously you have to do. In the book, there was seven steps for the first thing you had to do, and there was only three pictures, so it was really, really hard to figure out what was going on. Um, 
But I started anyways from the book, and I made a lot of mistakes. We don't even need to point out all the different mistakes that are going on there. But the one that I focused on first was the fact that I started with 20 stitches, and by the time I was 10 rows later, I had like 44 stitches. <laughs> so I knew there was something wrong, and I knew exactly what that problem was. So I was doing it, but I was also analyzing what I was doing. And I was able to search in Google very specifically for how to avoid adding stitches during knitting. And there, believe it or not, maybe there's a video of somebody who describes exactly that thing. So it's a six minute video on exactly that problem. It took me about a minute and a half in the video to figure it out. But this is a social learning thing. There's a person on the other end who's an expert in knitting and is gonna show me, even through a virtual environment, how to do this properly. And then my kids are now both very happy that they have their own scarves. <laughs> So this is one example of active learning. Learning a language is another example of active learning, but organic chemistry and learning chemistry is also another form of a skill that you need to practice in order to learn it. And so that's what I'm gonna focus on today. And so my goal is to keep them engaged and also get them to do things during the lecture period, just like we just did. And this is um, the thing I start every single lecture with. So some of you may know we have this thing called Michigan time. So one class ends at 10 and my class will start at 10.10. I sneak in the room the minute the professor before me has finished <laughs> and I go up and put on the projector one of these problems. So as my students are filtering into the room during that 10 minute period, they pull out their notebook and they start working on the problem. And typically the problem will cover whatever it is we covered in the last lecture. So it's a way for them to check whether or not they've retained what they learned in the past lecture. And it's also a way for them to practice the skills that they're learning and talk to each other because class hasn't started yet so they can sit down and they work on it together often. Once class starts, I will call on a few students to talk about their solution. And I don't even, I don't have them focus just on the answer. I make them talk through how they got to that answer. So what are all the steps they did along the way? And what this is useful for is that the students are hearing another set of problem solving strategies, um, but it's also useful if they have any misconceptions and so they say something that's wrong. I can fix that for everyone all at the same time. So often when we get to the end of one student doing this answer, I will say, well, how many of you agree with this answer? And then by a show of hands, I can tell whether or not everyone else is following. And if they're not, obviously then I tell them that they need to go back and work on this some more. And if it's a really bad misconception, like the majority of the class doesn't understand what's going on, I will start lecture by fixing that. We'll go over the material again. And it's a good way to make sure that they're keeping up with what's going on in the class. This is one of the favorite things that I've added so far because I love seeing my students working before the class has even started with the material. Another thing I do which is related to this is I take a lot of breaks during the lecture for them to work on solving some problems. And so I'll teach what I call like a mini lecture on a new concept and then I'll give them a problem that relates to that concept. And again, I give them time to work alone. So in this case, I gave them three minutes and I said for a minute and a half, work alone. And then for the next minute and a half, I want you to talk to other people. And I put the timer up there so they can keep track of you know, how much alone time they should be spending because if they're getting stuck, they're gonna be tempted to just keep working on it by themselves and they're gonna be too embarrassed, I think, to admit it. Um, so this does a number of things. I have them again, sort of a couple people share the answers at the end of this period and we talk about whether or not everybody's understanding and following what's going on. But the fact that they're talking to each other encourages some collaboration in the room. It builds a sense of community and it helps them build their self-esteem too because in some cases they will know what's going on and they can help their partner and in other cases they're benefiting from their partner and they're learning new problem solving strategies as well. Um, and as I mentioned, I use feedback, the non-technology feedback. I have them just raise their hands and so not everybody votes, it's their option, um, but I can get a quick read on whether or not the whole class is following or at least, at least half of the class is following what's going on. So in class on Wednesday, I was covering a new reaction called ozonolysis and I actually thought it was a fairly simple reaction and for some reason they just weren't getting it. So the first problem I threw up at the end of the mini lecture, it was like crickets. I mean, they didn't even know how to start the problem. <laughs> so I stopped them and I said, all right, let's work on this together first. We worked through that problem and I gave them another one and I still saw them struggling. When I called for people to volunteer, no one would volunteer. And so we worked through that one again and we worked on another problem and I just continue working with them until I'm sure that the majority of them are catching up and following along with what's going on. And I do have to cut things later on and shrink other things, but it's more important to me that they understand the concepts as we're teaching them rather than leaving them all confused and moving on to the next thing that's gonna also confuse them. There is a technology-based uh, version of showing up your hands. <laughs> so these are called clickers, they're like little remotes and they're tied to the student's ID. So some faculty really like this because they can use it to take attendance, they can give points for the question and answers, 
Um, and this way, they can keep the students engaged. Right? These students look very engaged because they're probably getting credit for their answer. <laughs> um, I don't like it personally because it's a little clunky. First of all, you have to have all your questions ready before the class starts, so you can't create them in real time. And most of the time when I'm asking for a show of hands, it's something that spontaneously arises during the discussion. So it's, I feel like it's a little um, difficult to work with that technology and do it effectively. So this is not an active learning aspect, but this is one way that I try to um, keep them engaged in the course. And so I try, and I know all of my colleagues do this as well, we wanna make our science as relevant as possible to their daily lives. And so whenever I'm picking and talking about a concept, I'm always trying to find a way to relate to them. So I teach a lot of pre-med students, and so I focus a lot on drugs. And in this case, I'm gonna tell a very quick story about this drug named thalidomide, which some of you may be familiar with. So the structure of the active form is at the top on the left, and the thing I want you to focus on is the hydrogen that's on that wedge. That means that that hydrogen is sticking out of the plane of the screen, and the nitrogen <coughs> that's on the dashed line, that's sticking behind the screen, and the rest of the molecule is in the plane. And so the difference between the molecule on the top left and the bottom right is that orientation. So the hydrogen that used to be sticking out is now sticking back, and the nitrogen that was sticking back is sticking out. <laughs> So that's the basic concept of this thing called stereochemistry. And it, they're two different molecules with very different properties. And we spend a whole chapter <laughs> teaching them how to, um, how to recognize when you have these stereoisomers, how to label them, and why they're important, and how to generate them in reactions. But it's a very abstract concept. Like, they're connected to the same carbon. A lot of my students are like, why do we care whether or not they're pointing in or out? Like, what difference does it make? So this is a great example to highlight that. Um, it was a drug that was originally prescribed in 1957 in Germany for morning sickness. And having gone through morning sickness myself twice, I totally understand the need for a drug to help combat that. Um, the problem was the R form, so the form on the top left, was the active form of the drug. But they sold it as a mixture of both the top and the bottom. And the reason they did this is that it's cheaper and it's easier. When you make the compound, you actually make the mixture and you have to separate them. And so it was just easier to market the mixture. And they thought that the one on the bottom was benign. But as many of you probably know and are familiar, it was not benign. It was actually a really severe mutagen. So there were about 10,000 babies that were born with severe birth defects because of this drug, because of the mixture. And about, only about 50% of them survived. So it was a really major um, error, basically, on the, the part of the scientists. And this is the thing that people point to these days. I mean, we learned this lesson, right? <laughs> Everyone learned this lesson, and we don't make this mistake anymore. And so any drug that's um, sold as a mixture now, you really have to very, very well demonstrate that both forms, or the, the, the non-active form is totally innocent in the body. Um, but this is a way for me to make you care about the stereochemistry, right? Um, these are future doctors. Now I've just told them why they need to care about stereochemistry as well. And so this is just one of my techniques for keeping them sort of interested in what I'm talking about and hopefully get them to want to think about it and talk about it later, you know, with family and friends and other people. Okay. Um, one of the other things that I do for my students when I'm giving them a problem is sometimes I'll give them a problem that's too hard for them to do at all and I just let them struggle on it for a few minutes. And the reason I do this is it gives them uh, access to problem-solving strategies that they wouldn't have generated otherwise. So if I give them a reaction that's got two different reagents in it and they've never seen it before, they're gonna sit there and think, well, let me go back to earlier in the semester. Professor McNeil told me that all reactions take place between a nucleophile and electrophile, so I need to figure out which one is which, and that's where I'll get started. So it's a problem-solving strategy that they wouldn't have pulled up if we had just talked about this topic. And so I do this every now and then to get them to see the connections between the material that they're doing. And so I let them struggle for about 30 seconds, and then I tell them, let me give you a little help. Let me give you some more information, and I'll give them just a tiny bit more. And I'll say, you know, this is related to this reaction we studied two weeks ago. Um, think about that and the parallels there, and I'll let them work on it some more. And I'll just do this over and over again until they get enough information <laughs> where they can solve the problem. And this is, I've seen this is a very powerful strategy. There's light bulbs that are going off as they start sort of making those connections. Um, and so I was going to do that with you here. This is not a perfect fit for what I do in class because I'm not going to go over a lot of chemistry, but instead I'm going to have you think about um, this issue of pure extract of vanilla versus the imitation vanilla. Um, so this is hopefully something that everybody can relate to here. 
And the pure extract is a lot more expensive than the imitation, but I'm sure that you have a good reason if you are buying the more expensive version for that. So I want you to think about which version you would or do buy, and then why you're buying that version. And I'll give you about 30 seconds, and I'm gonna ask you to share again. So think quietly for a few seconds. is sharing with each other, which is great. Now I'd like to sh have you share out why you're buying which form of vanilla. There's one over here. Um, it depends on what you're making. It's a great um, question. If the vanilla is part of a lot of other things and, and it's just sort of like an undercurrent, you can use the imitation. If the vanilla is the primary flavor, then you want the real thing. <laughs> told me the only call on people with the microphone, so we're going to try that. <laughs> people on the I'm side I'm going to disagree answer. with her. Um, as the daughter of a baker and a baker myself, I only use the pure vanilla. I can taste it when someone's used imitation, no matter how little the format is. Hmm. It tastes chemical to me. So taste and depends on what you're baking. Do you want to, there's some people over here. Get back at the I've been told by um, a number of people sitting nearby that the pure vanilla is about 60% alcohol. Pure vanilla is best because, sorry. 60% alcohol, and that has other benefits. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll do one more. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I just go for pure, pure vanilla extract because I believe it's, I believe it's, say, it's basically, well, for the imitation vanilla flavor, who knows what might be in there? Even, well, yes, even though I even though I have taken AP Chemistry as a freshman, I still I do I still not who knows what might be in there, and I'm still I feel, I just feel safer with the, buying the pure, so it's worth the cost. Okay, that was a perfect segue into my next slide. So this is me revealing layers to you slowly and getting you to rethink about what you just said. So what if I told you that the bottle of vanilla that you're buying has the same component in there for vanilla? So the thing that you're tasting as vanilla is this compound known as vanillin. And it's the same structure in the same compound, whether you've got it from the extract or from a synthetic route. So I will admit <laughs> that the extract has other things in there, and that's because you're extracting from a bean, and so a lot of things are coming out of that when you're extracting it. Um, there's estimates on between 200 and 250 different compounds in there. The majority of them we have to use really high accuracy instrumentation to even detect because they're in such low quantities. And the majority of them actually boil off when you're baking. So they're not there in your final product. So I'm gonna let you take that in for a second and think about this again. Um, I won't ask you to share out, but let's just think about it again for a few seconds about which one you might buy next time. I'm not going to share it, yeah. All right. I'm going to use the technology-free version here, and just by a show of hands, have I convinced anybody to change their mind about what they're buying? All right, we got a couple of takers. All right, let me let reveal one more layer for you. Let's talk about the sources of where they come from. So the pure extract is coming from the bean of this orchid plant, and the reason it's so expensive is that it has to be hand-pollinated. So there's people that are hand-pollinating the extract. And it's also only able to be grown in a few tropical areas. And so they actually deforest that area and set up a vanilla bean farm. So it's not the most sustainable. And as you can see, it's only less than 1% of the total market of vanilla because everything else that you buy that's vanilla flavored is coming from the imitation vanilla. So 85% of that, you know, your vanilla candles, your lotions, your cookies, your ice cream, all of that's the imitation vanilla. 
Imitation vanilla has not got a great source either. That's oil, and we all know that that's not going to be around forever. Although right now it's very inexpensive, which is why it's easy to sell the imitation vanilla really cheaply. And the comments came up about it feels better, it's more pure. It turns out actually imitation vanilla is more pure. It's only the vanillin compound in that solution. And it, because it's made synthetically, it undergoes rigorous purification that the extract doesn't ever go and undergo. Okay, so um, <laughs> this is an example of sort of slowly peeling back the layers. I have actually one more layer to share with you. Um, if you add up these totals here, we're only at 85% of the market, and the question is where's the other 15%, and what's gonna take over when oil is no longer, vanilla is no longer deemed the most useful use of our oil as we start dwindling that down. What's gonna take that over? And this actually happens to be a really major research area that's totally active right now. And so 15% of the other vanilla actually comes from trees. So if you take a tree and you cut it down and you start processing it to make paper, there's a byproduct from that called lignin. And it is largely being used for waste right now, but people are starting to realize that this is not waste and we should take advantage of it. There's a company in Europe, one single company who's been doing this for decades. They break down that lignin and the vanilla comes out of it. So they're doing a chemical process to break it down, but it's, they're not synthesizing it. They're just breaking down this polymer that has vanillin in it. Um, and the, this is a sustainable approach. We can grow more trees. And there's a review here that I cited um, just to show you that this is a super active area of research. And there's a lot of people that are trying to derive vanilla from other natural sources so that we can get away from the orchid bean and we can also use our oil for other purposes. Okay, so the last thing that I'm gonna talk about in this section on making the lectures more engaging and interactive is this thing that we can do at the end. And I'm actually gonna ask you to do this at the end. So there's two versions of this, but basically at the end of the class, we're asking the class to reflect on the class period. And in the muddiest point reflection, what I'm asking them to do is write down the most confusing thing that you heard today. So as you leave lecture today, what are you still really confused on? That feedback is really useful to me because if the majority of the class is confused on something, I need to go over it again. And students can write this down on paper and turn it in, or they can do it electronically. The other thing that you can ask them to do at the end of class is just to look back through their notes of what, they, what we covered during the, the class and ask them to write down the two or three most important concepts. And this is more for them than it is for me, um, but it's an opportunity for them to think about what they just learned and what are the big pictures that they need to take away. I can still look at this information to see if those big pictures match what I think the big pictures of the lecture were, and I can comment on those next time. Um, but in both cases, it's feedback for them and for me about what we need to do after we leave the lecture period to improve our learning. Um, so actually, I'm gonna ask you to do one of these two things. So you can, even tell, you can either tell me on your note card at the end, <coughs> please wait till the end, uh, what, what was the most confusing thing you heard today <laughs> or what was the, um, the takeaway that you got from them. Both of those are useful to me. All right, so I'm gonna summarize this first part of my talk just by saying that these are the challenges I face and the way I'm trying to combat those challenges is by keeping my students engaged, by having them do problem solving in class, having them thinking about what they're doing and not just the doing, working with their peers, telling me how they're understanding the material in real time, and telling me afterwards as well. And this is actually the first semester that I'm implementing all of these. So my old way of lecturing has been around for forever. I used to talk at my students for an hour, and I can see a huge difference in how the lecture is going this semester. I haven't done any analysis yet to see how it's affecting their learning, but I can see a difference in how engaged they are in the number of students that are engaged during that time period. Okay, so now I'm gonna totally switch gears on you, and I'm gonna go from the big lecture to a small teaching lab. There's still the same number of students enrolled in this, but they're now meeting in smaller groups with a graduate student instructor during that period. So they meet in, a, in a groups of about 20 during the lab period, and it's also a longer period. It's three hours long. And the, through the HHMI grant, I've been working on completely overhauling this lab because it was not a very engaging lab to begin with. And I'm sure some of you are probably wondering <laughs> how you could take a lab where they're actually doing things and thinking about what they're doing and make that not be engaging. But some of you probably also have experiences of college science labs that were not very engaging. I certainly did. Um, and this is how we've made it not very engaging. So we're basically covering content that they've already covered in high school. So this is the first semester lab that they take freshmen. Most of our freshmen take this class as their first lab class. And right now, there's four required labs and then four optional labs. From what I've told, no one does the optional labs because you don't get any extra credit for doing it and why do anything that you don't get extra credit for. 
So they take the whole semester to do these four experiments that they've already done, most of them, in high school. Um, and the, the reason, I, I mean, I feel bad sort of throwing my colleagues under the bus on this, and so the reason that this lab got to this point is that we do have a diverse group of students coming in with a diverse preparation. So for their first science lab, some students have done all these experiments and some have done none, and we have to somehow teach to all of them. Um, but we've sort of devolved this class down to the lowest common denominator, and my goal is to try to elevate it again, but not lose anybody in the process. The other thing that you'll notice about this lab is that it follows the traditional lab format that you've probably experienced as an undergrad back in the days. And you work alone, you're self-paced, you follow a procedure, it's like a recipe. You go in, you mix the things, you wait for them to react, and then you work them up just as described. And so you're confirming things that everybody knows are gonna happen. Thousands of students before you have done this experiment, thousands after you will do it. It's just not very exciting. And it's not very connected to the real world. They know that this is not research. Um, and so it's really disappointing for me to know that we're exposing 2,000 students to their first chemistry experience and we're saying, this is chemistry, like take a look at this. So this is what some of our students say about this class and I will fully admit that I picked some of the most negative comments from the um, evaluations. These are end of semester uh, teaching evaluations that are totally anonymous. And what they say is shown here, they think it's a waste of time, it actually has little to do with organic chemistry and that is true. Um, it was too basic, they covered it in high school, they knew busy work, they knew it already, and they didn't learn much. And so even though these are some of the most negative comments, and there are certainly students who loved the class because it was new to them, um, these are heartbreaking to me because these are potential people who could be interested in chemistry, could be interested in science, and we're telling them that this is like what lab and chemistry is like. I do want to point out that the instructor who's teaching this course, it is not her <laughs> creation. This is a course that's been passed down for two decades now to different people, and they actually love her. So in the same semester they're saying this about the course, they gave her almost a five out of five, which is nearly statistically impossible on this size of a class. So there's about 1,100 students enrolled in the class, and this means on the question of overall, this was an excellent instructor, almost everybody's picking a five, which is strongly agree. Um, so it's pretty impressive, and she's actually won the student-nominated award, the only student-nominated teaching award called the Golden Apple Award. So she's an amazing lecturer, and she's teaching this class that, we, that she has to teach because this is the way it is. So this is what I want to fix. Um, we have, because I'm working on trying to fix it, we've been collecting data from the class as it sits now before we roll out the new class. And here's some of that data. So when we ask them at the beginning of the semester what their interest level is in chemistry just as a subject matter, they pick a number from one through 10. And then at the end of the semester, we ask them that same question. So we're comparing the, what they said on the first day of class to what they said on the last day of class. And it's just general interest in chemistry. They can interpret that any way they want. And so 50% of the students have no change, 16% have a decrease, and 35% have an increase. So it's, in my mind, that's a pretty small number. Only 35% of the students are actually slightly more interested than they were at the start of the semester, and a bunch of them either didn't change or lost interest. Um, and this is true nationally, so when they ask people, when they leave, this, they come in saying they want to do STEM and then they leave, a lot of them cite these intro classes as just not being really exciting to them and that they go off to pursue something else that they are interested in. So this is my challenge and this is what I would like to fix with my new curriculum. And we modeled the new curriculum off of two ideas. The first is that you want to mimic the, re the actual real research lab that chemists work in. We want to mimic that as much as possible. It's challenging because the scale is so much larger, but we should be able to get closer than what we have now. So I'm going to try to mimic my research lab. And I've used Harrington's model for what defines an authentic activity. And we particularly picked these six. I think she has 10 total. So I'm going to ask my students to consult a variety of resources during the course of the semester. I'm going to give them opportunities to work together and reflect on what they're doing. I'm going to allow competing solutions, so they're going to design their own experiments. They get to pick how they're going to take that direction, and there will be a diversity of outcomes just because they get to pick how they're designing their experiment. All of the, the content is going to be tied into the real world. The problems will be somewhat ill-defined. This is the one that we struggle with a little bit with 2,000 students. We can't give them total freedom because we wouldn't be able to even accommodate, you know, if they wanted to use a certain chemical and there's 2,000 students that want to do that, that would be really challenging to do. Um, and then it's going to occur over a long time. So there's a sustained investigation. They're going to spend a couple of weeks on something so they can really learn it instead of sort of these drive-by, like come in, do a lab, leave, and forget about it. 
All right, so this is my only really text-heavy slide, but this is the meat of the curriculum, so I want to walk you through it. Uh, each of these, we call this one module, and we have three modules in the course, and each of these take a place over a very similar three-week sequence. So in week one, they're going to learn a new reaction and likely a new lab technique. And this is the skill building phase. So this is the way we're addressing the fact that not every student comes in prepared. So some students will have already learned the skill when they come in. That one week, they might um, you know, learn a little bit more. But the majority of them are going to be sort of getting up to the same level of, of understanding of that. So that's our skill building week. In week two, we're sort of um, departing from conventional wisdom here, and we're actually not going to have them do any experiments whatsoever. It's a totally dry lab. They're going to come in, and they're going to analyze their data from the previous week. They're going to learn something new, and then they're going to design their experiment for the next week. So they get to take a pause, think about what they've done, and think about what they want to do. And there's no um, sort of rush to sort of set up the lab and do that. There's just this pause during the middle. Then they come in on the third week, they run their experiment, they collect their data, they take that data home, and then they're going to later write a writing assignment based on that data. So there's a, this aspect of sustained investigation, and we're trying as much as possible to mimic the research environment by letting them design their own experiment based on what they learned from the previous week. All right, so I'm going to walk through one of these modules so that you can kind of see the, the flexibility and inflexibility that we've built into the system. So in week one, this is module number two that we used last semester. In week one, they're going to run three different reactions. They're going to take the starting material on the left, convert it to the products on the right. There's um, two possible distinguishable products. There's actually four total. And they're going to do some data analysis to figure out which reaction leads to which product. They're not going to be able to know which one is which. They're just collecting the data. In week two, they will try to assign the product to a specific structure. Um, and they're going to do this in small groups. So I have them in groups of four set up the three reactions. And what we noticed last term is that the students pick up a role. So one person will go and be the person that weighs out the reagents. And another person will be the, the their role will be to analyze the reaction while it's going on. And another person will work out the reaction. So they kind of define their own roles. And they um, share and distribute the workload. So in week two, there's three aspects. It's three hours long. And we have basically three one-hour activities set up for them. When they first come in, they're going to analyze the data they collected. So for us, we're going to give them some information about the authentic compounds. And then they're going to try to figure out which product they got in each of those reactions. And then once they identify them, they have to figure out how they were made. So they're going to sit there and try to figure out the mechanism, like why this reagent with this material led to this product. So they spend about an hour doing that. And we give them very guided worksheets. So we help them along the way, give them reflective questions to think about. And then comes the meat of week two. <laughs> we do this thing um, called the jigsaw group. And it's, it looks more complicated than it actually is. So these four squares on the left of different colors, those are the home groups, the groups that they, in the previous week, um, in week one, did the experiment together. And what we're going to do for the next hour is we'll take one person from each of those groups, and they form a new group that we call the expert group, or the jigsaw group. They're going to learn something new. And we're going to teach, so overall, we're teaching four new things. Each group member, each group has one member that's learning one thing. They go back then after they learn the new thing, and they teach it to their peers. So they know that they're going to be involved in teaching this to the peers, so they pay really close attention to what's going on and what they're learning. And then as a group, they get to decide how they want to move forward based on what they just learned. So as an example of a jigsaw activity, in this particular lab, we introduce them to the concept of green chemistry. So this is the idea of trying to make whatever it is you're making um, in a more sustainable way for the environment. And there's, I think, 12 principles of green chemistry. We picked four of them. And the University, University of Toronto has this really great video series that explains it. So we just borrowed those. We let them watch the video. And then they answered some questions and did some problems based on that. Um, so each member of the group is going to learn about one principle. They're going to come back together as a group and decide which ones they want to use to um, measure the greenness of their reaction in the next week. OK, so then for week three, this is still part of week two. They're gonna, this is their challenge that they have to do in week three. We assign each of them a unique molecule. So each group gets one molecule, and they're all different. And we give them a couple of different starting materials and then the same three reactions that they ran in week one. And they have to combine what they learned about the, um, the way the reactions work in week one. They have to combine that information with their specific target. And then they're going to apply whichever principles they want of green chemistry. And we tell them, just tell us which one's the greenest route. So if you have three routes to get there, which one do you think will be the greenest? And then they're going to go design that experiment and test it. So they come in in week three. They design their experiment. 
Um, and they have to, <laughs> importantly, they have to do some controls. So they need to, if they say this one's greener than the other two routes, they have to do the other two routes and show that that was in fact true. They collect and analyze their data, again, doing this all in groups. So you can see here, <laughs> they're all very interested in this one thing happening. Um, and then when they go home, since everything's done in group setting in the lab, when they go home, this is their one chance to shine as an individual. And I asked them after each three-week sequence of a module to do a writing assignment. In this particular case, it was an argument-driven essay. So they're going to state their hypothesis, state their rationale, and then they're going to give the evidence and go through their data and then talk about how that evidence either supports or refutes their rationale. So I have just a sample of the intro paragraph from one of these essays. And it says, I hypothesized that oxone would be greener because when I ran the experiment earlier, I found that it produced little waste, used a safe solvent, and it had good atom economy. So that's their hypothesis that they're going to test. Um, <laughs> we did do peer review with all of these writing assignments, but it was pretty much a complete disaster because they didn't, we didn't ask them to reflect on their own writing while they were doing it. So one of the values of peer review is seeing good and bad examples from your peers and using that to modify your own writing. And we didn't specifically ask them to do that, so they didn't. And then the comments that they gave their peers were usually very surface, and they weren't that helpful to them. So I actually had some students turn in the same draft that they turned in for peer review, because they didn't find the comments all that helpful. So we're, this is one area that we're totally changing for the next round, and because we realized it, w it just didn't work very well the way we did it. All right, so here's some quotes from when I taught the class. And I will admit now, I'm picking some of the positive quotes. But this was more, um, I'm going to actually talk about some of the critiques later. There were more people that were positive on this side than there were in the previous case. Um, and this is representative of the ones that we heard. So they felt like they had a more thorough understanding of fewer things because they weren't doing something different every week. Um, they got to think through what they were doing. They really liked being able to have some freedom in how they designed their experiment. And they felt like it was real research, which was great. That was the goal. Um, and I will point out as well that they didn't love me as much as they love Kathleen. <laughs> um, so now they're just agreeing that I'm an excellent instructor. They don't strongly agree with that. Um, so this was probably our most exciting data so far. Keep in mind that the previous plot I showed you was 700 students, and this is 55, because I piloted this in one section of the course. Um, but we had a 48% increase in interest in chemistry, and I'm most excited by that 9% that went up three points. So they went from you know, level five to level eight, for example in their interest level in chemistry, which I was super excited about. Um, and we only had 13% have a decrease, and a smaller chunk of people have no <laughs> change in their opinion on chemistry. I will say that we are also trying to collect data on whether or not these things are effective. And that's you know, a big part of this. But since we're still working on many of the components of it, we didn't collect a ton of data this semester, this past semester. But this is one that we did collect. So what we did is um, for the ex one of those week one experiments where they were learning a new skill, uh, they were learning to do what's called thin layer chromatography. We did a pre and a post survey. What that means is when they come into the class, they take a survey with some questions on it. And then at the end of the class, they take the same survey. And so we look at the measurement gain in their understanding of the concept. And what we saw is over here on the right, 46% of the students had an increase in their understanding of the concept, which was great. I was hoping that number would be a little bit larger. Um, but then I noticed that 15% actually had all the questions correct at the beginning and at the end. Um, so <laughs> we need to clearly make it a little bit harder of a conceptual quiz so that that group can maybe improve on their understanding throughout the course. Um, so here are some of the negative comments and some of the critiques. We had a full quarter of the students mention something about the lab that they wanted to be improved. And we felt a lot of these while we were going along. So even in the example I showed you, they were a bit constrained in their design. Right? They get to pick the principles of green chemistry. They get to pick the starting materials and the reactions. But there's only a limited number of those picks that they can pick. Right? There's probably six unique options that they get to choose from. And many students actually wanted more than that. They wanted to have a little bit more flexibility. Um, they really didn't like that I didn't focus on the lab in the lecture. So there's a pre-lab lecture that happens each week. And I intentionally didn't want to stand up there and say, all right, this week you're doing this reaction, and this is how it goes, because I wanted them to figure that out in the lab period. But clearly, I think I went too far on the extreme of talking about the bigger picture. And I should do a little bit more of mentioning at least the chemistry that's going on in the next week. And then they were always rushed. And this is true. We ran over almost every single time. We just totally um, underestimated how long it would take them to do the, the experiments. 13% said they wanted to be better prepared. I'm surprised this isn't 100%. 
because as the semester went on, we were literally like, they were, the copies were still warm from the copier as we were giving it to them at the beginning of the lab period because we, it was just really hard to keep up with um, the, the pace of the semester going on. So they wanted their instruction sheets ahead of time. I totally agree with that. That was our goal. We just didn't make it there the whole time. And then 11% complained about the grading. This is also not too surprising, although all of the comments about grading were um, about the writing <laughs> because we graded those fairly harshly. This is their one chance to shine as individuals. I spent a, a fair amount of time in the lecture talking about how to write well, and they weren't writing well. They were not taking the assignment very seriously, and so they got poor grades on them, and, and they complained. Um, so this semester and this summer, we're completely overhauling all of these rough edges, and we're going to implement it again in the fall in another pilot section, and then in the winter term of next year is when we're going to roll it out to the 1,400 students, which is a bit scary. <laughs> um, so those are all things that we can fix. What I have here on the slide and what I kind of wanted to start to end with is things that I, I'm not sure how to fix yet. So the first issue is that I was able to handpick my GSIs because I only needed four for this pilot section. I could handpick really advanced organic chemistry students, and I needed that because we were trying to do a lot of things, and I needed them to be subject area experts. We taught them about the pedagogy that we were trying to um, enforce in the students, but we, weren't, we didn't have the time to teach them about the content, too. As I move forward to the rollout, though, I don't have that luxury. So we, for example, this semester, this course, the 211 large course, doesn't have a single GSI that's an organic chemist student. They took chemistry as an undergrad, but their specialty is in another area. So they're not subject matter experts anymore, and it's going to be a lot more challenging. And I don't know how to solve this problem yet, because I know how to give them the content, but I don't know how to make them care enough to actually learn it all um, for each of the labs. And then the other thing I worry a lot about is unless this is a really well-oiled machine, when I pass this off to somebody, which I hope to someday, I don't want to teach this class forever, um, I hope it is sustainable, because we spent a lot of time and effort putting it together, and the last thing I wanted to do is go back to like what it was before. So simplify it, because it's too complex. So I worry a lot about both of these issues, and these are present in anybody who's trying to design a new class. All right, so um, one of the things I wanted to end with is pointing out the fact that I did not do this alone. This takes a substantial amount of work and effort and insight from a lot of people. Um, I mentioned I meant to put a slide in about Rebuild, Tim, and I forgot this morning. <laughs> but the Rebuild group on campus, which is a dozen or so faculty and another dozen or so postdocs, um, has really contributed to the first part of my talk in terms of um, pulling out from the literature things that are effective strategies. This group here worked on the second half, and this was all funded, mostly all funded by the HHMI. So Michelle Nelson has a PhD from the School of Ed here, and she's been invaluable as essentially my co-PI on this. And Samir is the one who did all the heavy lifting last semester, so he created every single instructional sheet that went out to the students. Um, Danielle's working on a different aim in this grant, but Carol Ann, has, who's a rebuild postdoc, has taken on the massive challenge of rethinking how we do writing in this course. I strongly believe that it's important to work on their writing. I strongly believe that this is a way for them to reflect and learn, but we've got to figure out a better way to actually make it work. And then this volunteer army here at the bottom, they volunteered their time last summer every week to sit in a room with me and, and figure out how to put this course together. And this course doesn't exist anywhere else. We took pieces of courses that we saw that were in the literature, and we kind of mixed them together. So we took things from things we liked everywhere, mixed them together, and they were a big part in that. So I am forever thankful for all of their time and their free time. Um, so that's what I have for today. I'm excited to hear your feedback and answer your questions. Thank you.